Welcome to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me tonight is Chairman Jeff McKay, who is the new chair of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we should assure our listeners that we are doing this at a distance. You are in your home studio. I'm in my home studio. Like most of America's media, um, everything's been done remotely, and this is no different. So I do appreciate your time because you have a lot on your plate at the moment. Let's start out a little bit by introducing you to people who may not know um, your backstory. Uh, the fact that you're a native of the area, and that your professional career has really been all about the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Maybe you could recap that for us. Uh, Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Again, thanks for having me. Um, I know we're living in unprecedented times, and we'll we'll certainly talk a lot about that. But a little bit about me. Um, First, I was born and raised in Fairfax County, lived here uh, my entire life, and you know, I'm actually third generational uh, native uh, to Fairfax County, and so um, you know, this has always been home. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to call Fairfax County home. Um, I did get involved in local government and politics, in particular uh, voting rights uh, and affordable housing at a very young age. I had a, a grandmother who served for decades on the Redevelopment Housing Authority at the county level and was a um, chief election officer at her voting precinct for for decades as well and so um, i kind of kind of you know got involved with her drank the kool-aid as some would say um, got my passion uh, watched her uh, be a force of nature in the community uh, make change happen advocate for uh, people who many times felt like their voice wasn't heard And she really was a leader at her time in women's voting rights. I can remember uh, being at her house on weekends when she was registering uh, new female voters, you know, to vote. Uh, And that was a passion of hers. And I can certainly also uh, remember uh, going to RHA meetings with her at a a young age and learning about things like public housing, financing. Um, And, you know, I, I, I got passionate about that stuff when I finished my education. Uh, there was an opportunity to uh, run a uh, supervisor's race uh, in Lee District where I had grown up, um, and I got to know my predecessor, Supervisor Kaufman, real well. And interestingly, was going to work on the campaign, uh, serve his office for a couple years, and then go do something else. And you know, 12 years later, uh, when he finished his term, uh, I loved every minute of what we were doing, uh, making positive change happen, and ultimately decided to run for supervisor myself, kind of take that leap into electoral politics. And, you know, I, when I look back on my 12 years at Lee District Supervisor and the things we were able to accomplish, um, you know, my passion for serving this community and, and doing what's right and advocating for uh, the, the entire Fairfax community, but most particularly in those years, Lee District, um, and our success rate, you know, kind of inspired me to run for chair. And so, yeah, combined service of now almost 25 years, uh, either on the staff or on the Board of Supervisors, and this is an amazing large county, and even after 25 years, um, I can learn something new every day uh, about this community, and, and that's one of the things that, that keeps me going. But I've been grateful to have served all those years, uh, and frankly, in times like this, uh, all those years of service are, are really helping me get through this this challenging time that we're in now. It is. It's an unprecedented time that we're living in right now. And and Lee District, you know, for those who may not in their brain have a map of Fairfax County broken up into magisterial districts, um, Lee District has got challenges of its own. Um, it's, it's, there's diversity within the district. It's got, it's got economic hurdles. Uh, at the beginning of this year in February, there was a devastating fire in the Lee District, um, the biggest fire, I believe, in the history of Fairfax County, which impacted a very important housing project. Yes, and, and I'm glad you bring that up because, um, you know, when I grew up in, in Lee District, I literally grew up in the Route 1 corridor. That's where I, where I went to school and where I learned everything I needed to know. 
uh, really about my community in Fairfax and frankly thought the whole county was like the community I lived in. And, and obviously a lot has changed in those years. Um, but Lee District has uh, a lot of assets as well that people forget. You know, it is home to the largest employer in the county with Fort Belvoir. Um, it does have had Metro uh, long before other parts of the county had it. Um, but it does have some of the highest concentrations of affordable uh, housing and, you know, some, some older stock housing. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is breathe, you know, breathe some fresh life into the community by revitalizing the Route 1 corridor in Central Springfield. And we've made huge, huge strides uh, in Central Springfield. Actually, the commercial tax base in Lee District grew second fastest as a percent in the county next to Providence District. Um, and people are surprised to hear that, but we've had massive uh, Defense Department growth, private sector growth, uh, resurgence of the Springfield Town Center, uh, and a lot of economic development happening on the Route 1 corridor. And so the fire that you referenced was a redevelopment project that I worked on for a lot of years. And what it was was um, demolishing an old strip-style shopping center that really was beyond its useful capacity anymore and transforming it into a very high-quality mixed-use development with built-in affordable housing, uh, market-rate housing, retail uh, a lot of amenities and really a signature project on the highway in terms of its its size and its scope and the type of investment uh, to make that happen. And so when the tragic fire happened, of course, there were a lot of people who instinctively thought that was the end, that, there, that, that they'd walk away and that project would never get completed and it would be another bad story for something in an area of the Route 1 corridor that needed revival. And so... Immediately after that fire happened, I pulled together the fire officials, the owners of the property, our buildings code people, um, and put together a team uh, with the county executive that would be dedicated to getting this project rebuilt uh, and completed. And I'm proud to say today, we get a weekly update every week, but I'm proud to say today that it's well on its way uh, to being reestablished. We probably lost two to three years of development uh, out there in 15 minutes time uh, on the day of the fire and so it was disheartening for a lot of people but you know it's a challenge and and like many challenges uh, you learn things from it but in this particular case uh, we will still complete the project and and you know it's um, won't be easy but we will get there and we've assigned the right team of people uh, help the owners there uh, who were affected by the fire recover it's a great example of resiliency, but uh, probably you didn't expect to be tested quite so quickly in your new role as chairman. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me tonight is Chairman Jeffrey McKay. He is the new chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. So in talking about the, the terrible fire that inaugurated the first, like, 30 days, the first, certainly the first 60 days of your chairmanship, you have, there's a new um, supervisor in Lee District, Rodney Lusk, and he's one of four brand new supervisors that have joined you on the Board of Supervisors. And you've got two other members, Dan Stork and Kathy Smith, who won re-election and are in their second term. So that's, you've got a lot of new talent, uh, a lot of new perspective mm -hmm. uh, with you on the board. And all of you are together facing some of the most unprecedented situations ever to hit the county, the state, or the country, or the world uh, in trying to deal with issues of the economy, our school system, closed businesses. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the budget process and the fact that because of the turmoil in our economy makes the budget process uh, that much more difficult. Can you talk a little bit about how you and your Board of Supervisors are managing even the day-to-day -day things like working remotely and the Board of Supervisors meetings? Sure. Um, so first, uh, we have an excellent team here, and, and you mentioned you know a lot of new supervisors, and uh, while we do have a lot of new board members, and that is pretty, um, pretty different in Fairfax County than the past, um, these are all people who 
have a great wealth of experience, uh, knowledge of the county government. Um, becoming an elected official for the first time, I can remember when I became one, you know, you think you know it all, and then you realize that it's a whole lot different than you expected. And even with the most experience in the world, um, it still is an adjustment. And so um, our new board members are adjusting to this new life, and as you acknowledged, immediately upon making that adjustment, uh, we put on the table a, a budget that reflected our, our values, and the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden life as we knew it uh, changed immediately, not just from a budget and financial standpoint, but as you acknowledged, from a day-to-day -day operational standpoint, and, and that has certainly been a challenge. Um, I'm very proud uh, of the way that we've handled it, um, frankly. Um, you know, every person, every board member has its own personality. And so, you know, the way in which I communicate with them and work with them on these things, you know, kind of varies district by district. But as a team, uh, we really have made sure that we're focused on getting the resources that we need to the people who need them, that we are quick to make uh, important decisions uh, regarding, you know, big things like how we take care of our county employees and how we pivot on the budget and how we accept citizen testimony and decide to meet virtually. Um, these are all history-making things. Um, I mentioned my 25 years here. I certainly have never seen anything like this. And, you know, people who have lived here many more years than that have, have told me the same thing. And this is history-making in Fairfax County. Uh, as an example, our board has never met virtually in the history of the county. And so while you have good plans in place to deal with pandemics, you have good plans in place of what to do if the board ever had to meet virtually. I think most of us were walking around thinking, those are good plans, but we'll probably never have to implement those. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're in implementation stage. And so th this board has been great. Uh, the community has been great. Um, as I said, they come here with a great deal of experience, and so um, us being able to work together uh, in a really collaborative way has, has not been a problem. Uh, there have been times where, you know, we've been frustrated by things, um, and we work through those, uh, I think, in a very professional, good way. So I'm proud of that. Um, I do think if you look around in the region, um, there's a lot of new boards and city councils and people making adjustments, and I've actually spent a good amount of my time conferring with uh, Delegate Phyllis Rand I'm sorry, Chairman Phyllis Randall and Loudoun County and Chairwoman um, Ann Wheeler in Prince William County, and the three of us spent a lot of time talking to each other because Prince William and Loudoun uh, have significantly new boards as well, and, you know, we share best practices and ideas with each other. Uh, how to get through this uh, as a team, really. And so it's built, if there's a silver lining in this, um, it quickly required our board to build strong, trusting relationships with each other, and it quickly built uh, rapport and um, friendships uh, among my colleagues in the region as we work on this together. We all get on calls every week, the, the mayors and chairs of the region, and share what's going on in our jurisdictions. And I feel like I know the mayors and chairs of the region as well as I know some of my own colleagues on the board. And that type of regional uh, collaboration is important as we get through this. Absolutely, because, you know, the county lines are pretty artificial. Um, there's roadways and all kinds of things that run through this region and, and things that have to be addressed. And so having good working relationships with your colleagues is so important, and with our state delegation and our federal delegation, too. Um, you know, the, our, our representatives, our senators and congressmen on the Hill, Congress people on the Hill, are working on federal packages to try to bring relief to some of the businesses in the county to the payroll uh, protection payment plan. Um, We've got our state delegation is meeting this week in Richmond. It was supposed to be a veto session, and I think they're going to be addressing a lot of things um, in what should be the last session of this legislative session that will also impact the county. So never before yes. has it been as critical um, to have all of our electeds talking with one another. 
Um, and even with absolutely county, agree. And we've got municipal elections, which is another thing. There are there are towns within Fairfax County that are slated to have May elections, and that's actually one of the things that the the state legislature will be addressing: whether to keep those uh, elections in May or to move them to November. So there are probably a lot of things people are not thinking top of mind are things that have to be decided and addressed. There is so much. I'm sure for you it must feel like drinking from a, a fire hose, all of the things that have to be decided and discussed. Yeah, it, it is a little bit like that. And, you know, I feel like I, I run from one conference call to the next, and, and I'm glad you brought those things up because as soon as we finish this call, um, I have a call with Senator Warner and, and Senator Kane to, to talk about, you know, the status of some of the federal uh, stimulus package issues that are working for Fairfax County, things that aren't working uh, for the county. And as you acknowledge, the General Assembly is meeting this week and having spoken to the majority leader and the Speaker of the House, one of the decisions that I had to make a few weeks ago uh, was to delay our budget public hearings by a few weeks uh, so that we could better see what happens in Richmond this week, uh, if anything. And, and as you acknowledged, uh, you know, it's important that we pay attention to what's happening in Richmond. So much of our budget uh, and even the way in which our board operates um, in this new world virtually with, with regard to FOIA and public testimony and so many things, obviously we want to make sure that, you know, we get a gold star for transparency and that we adhere to every um, letter of the law when it comes to conducting our business. And, and clearly, uh, we're watching Richmond this week to see what, if anything, uh, they do in the way of clarification of some of those things so that local governments who will be operating virtually for some time here um, are, are all doing it right. And so it just shows you in one week you know, how we interact closely with the state, how we're interacting closely with the federal government, um, and how important it is that all three tiers, local, state, and federal government, you know, are working together. And, and I think our, you know, our citizens expect that. Frankly, they should expect it. Uh, and with a lot of anxiety right now over, you know, what is not happening um, that should be happening, I think people have also appreciated more than I've ever seen uh, a confidence in and an expectation that their local government performs and performs well and frankly fills in some of the gaps for things that they might not be happy with that are not working well uh, either at the state or federal level and so we definitely feel like we're drinking water out of a fire hose if it's not you know helping other colleagues in the region it's making sure that the largest jurisdiction in the commonwealth of virginia is running and running well and we take care of our county employees who are out there on the front lines. I spent a lot of time uh, talking with our county employees and making sure that we're taking care of them. Obviously, we have the regular constituent questions coming in. Uh, we spent a lot of time fielding questions. I spent a lot of time uh, with our health department officials uh, responding to a lot of the needs that they have. Uh, they are, of course, first responders, frontline uh, employees at this point. Um, and dealing with a lot of our nonprofits and human services and business community, uh, our most vulnerable residents who are suffering, uh, our business community or who have been real challenges uh, economically and logistically uh, trying to make it through this time. Um, so, you know, those, those calls uh, consume a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time talking to our restaurant association, our chambers of commerce, um, you know, the, the Realtors Association and how even realtors are operating. And so I don't think many people realize the depth uh, of issues and groups uh, that we deal with on the county level uh, to make sure that our community continues to run as successfully as we can in what really is a, a lifetime crisis that we're dealing with. And so um, it is drinking water out of a fire hose, but um, it's important that you know, we continue that momentum and that we make the right decisions on things that are really affecting people's daily lives. And what could be more important right now than, than doing that and doing it well? Oh, I so agree with you. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. 
I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and we are talking with Chairman Jeff McKay, the new chair of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. And speaking of challenges, Jeff, you have two school-aged children at home where you are working, and the school system has had some challenges of its own last week and this week. Um, some technical issues that have presented a challenge. I know we have a, a lot of brand new school board members, too, who are also in their first term and faced with these overwhelming challenges. Um, what is the experience at your house and also your interactions with uh, the school board at this point? Uh, so great question. Um, I think we're all very frustrated. And, you know, first, out of the gates, I want to acknowledge that because there's a lot to be frustrated about. Um, in my own house, I have two elementary school kids. And, you know, this has been difficult. Um, my wife works full-time, uh, more than full-time. Um, I'm working more than full-time, and we're also trying to help two elementary school kids get through the day. And so I live every day the experience of so many parents uh, across the county who are dealing with the unprecedented stress uh, and anxiety over what is and isn't happening with distance learning and some of the other things that are, you know, concerning for parents, mental and emotional health of our kids, trying to help them through uh, an unprecedented crisis and with small kids and especially who don't even understand really uh, what's going on. And so as a parent, I, I feel that pain. Um, as a public servant, um, I'm really only singularly focused on fixing this. And, you know, there's a lot of effort, uh, unfortunately, that some people have put into criticizing and Monday morning quarterbacking. And to me, that's not healthy at this point. There will be plenty of time for us to look back, analyze what happened, um, and frankly, hold people accountable for things that, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people's opinion, should have been happening that weren't. Uh, but right now, in the middle of a crisis, what we really need is everybody to remain calm, understand we need to acknowledge that there's a lot of anxiety and anger, uh, but we really need to all be focused on what is the solution to the problem, because if we all get angry, then what example are we setting for our kids? And I think probably the most challenging thing for me in this whole scenario is that the, the teachers and the school-based folks are as frustrated and angry as we are. Um, you know, I talk to my own kid's teacher and talk to my, my friends at the FEA, and there's nothing that the teachers want to do more than to see their kids and teach their kids. And so it's very frustrating for them that this isn't working as well as it should be. And frankly, we can't be blaming uh, them for, for what's not happening. Uh, and this morning, you know, um, when I tried to, to log on, uh, like so many other parents and subsequent times since then and, and you know, meet with defeat, um, it, it can be terribly troubling. And so what I have done is I have reached out to the school board chair uh, our director of IT has reached out to the schools to offer as much support as we can possibly provide. I think people, uh, everyday people, don't understand the the difference between the school system and the county government. And the county government, you know, is is doing everything we can on our end to help, but we are not the folks who are responsible for the day-to-day -day governance of the schools and software and things of that nature. Um, and you mentioned the school board is new. This, this school board uh, took office and inherited uh, decisions that had been made over many years. So they're frustrated and they're not to blame either. And so we just need to stay focused on solving the problem as a community uh, and making sure that we manage the anxiety of our kids. Because really as a parent, while I want my kids to be involved academically, I also just want them to be healthy. And I want to make sure that they have a little bit of fun every once in a while, that there's teaching moments here that this pandemic has brought us that you can't teach in a classroom. And we need to be focused on our children's health right now uh, as much as anything. And, and hopefully that's what, what our parents are doing. Well, and I think that's, that's, those are wise words, Chairman, because, you know, resiliency is what we're trying to teach 
our kids as much as their ABCs and one, two, threes. What we need to be modeling for them is that things happen and you can't control everything that happens to you, but you can control what you decide to do about it. And so I think that is a huge teachable moment that these, especially these young kids, will carry into the rest of their lives is how, not just what happened, but what people did about it. Um, you know, a lot of people are comparing this to how Americans pulled together in World War II. Again, after Pearl Harbor, it was just people couldn't, you know, have anticipated what the next four, five years would bring. After 9-11, Americans pulled together. And so I think our best efforts are, in fact, focused on how do we move forward? How do we reinvent or how do we innovate solutions to things that we didn't anticipate? And so I do want to talk um, at length about what, what you're going to do with the budget process. Um, I know that that has always been an important, an important part of the budget process is having people give testimony, which has always been something that's been done in person. And that's just not possible right now. And never has it been more critical for organizations, nonprofits, special interest groups um, to have their voices heard than it is right now. We're going to go to a break. Please join us after this break. I am talking with uh, Chairman Jeff McKay of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors here on Making Change Radio on Radio Fairfax. Radio Fairfax, the go-to station for a truly unique and rewarding listening experience. Made by producers who want to share their love of music, talk, or ideas with you. Free of commercial corporate radio control. Radio Fairfax, your voice, your station. The Playlist. Join your host, Blake Mitchell, as he takes you on a weekly musical journey. Blake's music mixology is an inventive blend of pop, rock, jazz, Broadway, and classical. From Mozart to Moby and Satchmo to Sondheim, the playlist will leave you humming, toe-tapping, and maybe even singing along. Tune into The Playlist with Blake Mitchell, Sunday evenings at 8, for an hour of music like no other. Colin Davies, they call me the Professor of Rock. If you like early rock and roll and rockabilly by people like Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, Huey Smith, and Roscoe Gordon, come and listen to my show. I'm here every Thursday from 4 till 6. Join Mike Delaney Wednesday evenings at 9 for a weekly meeting with the chairman of the board, a true American idol, Mr. Francis Albert Sinatra. That's Simply Sinatra, Wednesday nights at 9 only on Radio Fairfax. The radio programs aired by FPA reflect the viewpoints of individual producers and do not necessarily represent those of the station, its staff, or supporters. Welcome back to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me tonight is Chairman Jeffrey McKay of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Here in this unprecedented moment in our history, um, the chairman is leading us through uh, an epic period in the county's history. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us tonight, Chairman. Sure. Glad, glad to be here and um, I know we wanted to, to talk about budget uh, and how we manage the budget uh, during this epic time. And, and first, let me uh, remind all your listeners that there are many ways in which the public can still participate in the budget process through the public hearings. And we have uh, public hearings that, you know, in the past have predominantly relied upon uh, folks coming in person to testify and, and clearly that's not safe at this point. And so our board made the decision to go to all virtual meetings, which means that each of our supervisors is joining in video from their offices. 
Um, I am chairing the meeting from the Maine Government Center. And when it comes to testimony, um, frankly, I think we actually are, are being more inclusive now uh, than even we were before, because not only can you submit written testimony on the budget, uh, you also can re record videos and have your video played as a part of the testimony. But the new piece that we've added, and this is something we've never offered before, which is real time allowing people to phone in uh, for their testimony. And we have a queuing system where people can be notified uh, when it's their turn to call in and make sure that we maintain order. But at our last meeting, we had several people testify live by phone uh, into the county board meeting. And it worked exceptionally well. And it affords people an opportunity uh, to not leave their homes, but in particular uh, for some folks, and I've heard this for many years in the county, that it's difficult for some people to travel to and from the government center to deliver live testimony. And so they are forced with having to write a letter and sending it in. Well, now uh, they can phone it in without leaving their house. And so in some ways, this has become a much more open process for the public to participate in. If not uh, that, it, it certainly is unprecedented. As I mentioned earlier, we've never met this way before. And I'm very happy with the way our last virtual board meeting went and think we can make it through this budget in a very transparent, uh, open way. And the testimony is very important this year. What we're facing is a, a different world than when the first budget proposal was unveiled by the county executive. Uh, since that time, a revised budget uh, has been put on the table that is challenging for a lot of us on the board because many of the values that we brought to the table were reflected in that first budget. And when the pandemic hit, you know, all of us had to pivot forward to think about how do we hold on to people's jobs? Uh, how do we help small businesses? How do we help nonprofits? How do we invest in, in even more so in our health department and in our first responders? And so uh, while we are still going to re remain focused on affordable housing, on environmental protection, on school collaboration, on, on employee compensation, on many of the things that the first budget made huge investments and in, historic investments, uh, we're going to continue to move the needle forward on all of those initiatives. And there's a lot we can do even if we don't have the finances to do them, uh, that, that we can make this year very productive. But for the budget itself, the revised budget reflects the fact that there's a huge economic impact on the county, um, like the rest of the world, uh, of this pandemic. And so, you know, we are going to look at how we respond to that. The, the budget, of course, does that. But the board, you know, is seeing a proposed budget by the county executive and ultimately won't act on the budget for several more weeks. And so the public testimony is really important uh, to shaping what that final product will look like. Um, but clearly we had to take off the table a lot of historic, what would have been historic investments in our priorities and instead focused on uh, setting aside money in a reserve account so that we can respond to the pandemic um, putting forward additional resources. Really the only new additional resources in this budget are for the health department. Um, and the budget is focused on maintaining the services that we already have um, and making sure that you know, we can get through this process and, and this pandemic uh, in a smart way so that financially uh, we're in a position to help our economy recover. And that's an important goal I have an important goal that our board has and, and something that you know we're, we're really going to have to change our focus on over the next uh, months and, and possibly years depending on you know how long this lasts. But for the public to be able to testify on April 28th, uh, 29th or 30th, our budget public hearings start at uh, 4 p.m. on the 28th and at 3 p.m. Uh, on the 29th and 30th and to be able to testify all you need to do is contact the clerk to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, on our web page, it has a lot of good information about how to do that and how to submit testimony and encourage as many people as possible to do that. Well, so we should mention that, that it's www.fairfaxcounty.gov is the website for the county government and pretty much any information you want to know, whether it's about 
testimony at the public hearings or coronavirus updates or, you know, any relevant information, you're going to find at fairfaxcounty.gov. For those of you who are just joining us, um, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. And tonight we're talking to Chairman Jeff McKay, who is the new chair of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. And we're talking about the budget right now and the, the, the invitation for the public to have even more diverse ways of having their voices heard throughout this budget process. Part of the challenge is going to be things like revenue, the fact that um, our local economy for the time being is, is ground to a halt for a lot of small businesses. Um, So Chairman McKay, how do you, in a time like this, not only try to adjust the estimated revenues from things like sales tax, while also trying to anticipate a growing need for people who are suddenly unemployed and who are in need of greater public services provided by both the county and also a phalanx of nonprofits who've always provided services um, to those in our county. You know, this seems to me a, a, a perplexing task with a lot of unknowns. Right. So, so let me start with, you know, acknowledging that. I think there's some other unknowns, too, that, that we need to think about. One is we really don't know what the extent of federal uh, support we're going to get is from the federal government. We really don't know. Uh, how all the budget amendments and how the revenue forecasts at the state level that have changed are going to affect uh, what we get, especially when it comes to public education funding. And we really don't know how long this pandemic is going to last and how much of an economic impact it's going to have on the county. And so I put all that out there because what we will do in May is adopt what I what I would call largely a placeholder budget. And, you know, we are in unprecedented times, and one of the unprecedented things that's going to happen here is normally we review our budget in mid-year. And normally at the mid-year, it's pretty anticlimactic. You know, we're pretty good. The county staff, and kudos to them, is very good about financial forecasts. And so when we get to mid-year in our budget cycle, it's a pretty anticlimactic event, and it's just usually a confirmation that our projected revenues are hitting their targets, and um, you know we're we're going to do well because, of course, counties in Virginia must balance their budget annually. It's not an option; we can't run a deficit, and so how we track those expenditures all year is important. What's going to be different this year is it's my belief at mid-year that we're going to have very clear picture of at least the amount of federal support the changes to state revenues that you know we were were guessing at this point what those are and really how long this pandemic lasts and have a better feeling for what the real numbers are behind it and so we have this placeholder budget uh, as i'm calling it that we will adopt in may and in mid-year i think we'll have clarity on a lot of these questions and we'll be able to make adjustments at mid-year and i think that's a responsible way to approach this because what we don't want to do is we don't want to be cutting county programs right now at jobs and exacerbating the economic problems in our community. We don't want to obviously cut back on vital services that our community is relying on. In fact, uh, we set aside a reserve account from leftover third quarter money uh, to help deal with with some of that. Um, but we need to we need to increase our expenditures. Uh, on human services, you know, we have a uh, coordinated services planning unit that, that triages calls for human service needs across the county, and we've seen a 40% increase in calls, and three-quarters of those have been about food resources, and so the county is putting in place and has put in place a lot of programs to help distribute food resources to help our nonprofits pivot from maybe what their normal work would be into providing those direct services to our residents, which, of course, has a cost component to it to the county. Uh, We have a homeless population that, you know, we're setting up hotel rooms for people who we think have had exposures. Um, It's the little things like that that start adding up. And so what we have focused on is getting through this budget cycle um, with an expectation that at mid-year, a lot of adjustments are going to be needed to be made. And so 
Um, I suspect a lot of citizen input at that point in a process that normally no one even pays attention to uh, being the big show this year, more so than the, than the May budget adoption. So let's talk a little bit about throwing money toward things like health services needed in order to track this virus in the county to do testing more widespread testing for people who may have COVID-19, and also testing antibody testing once there is a reliable quick test so that we know how many people have had it and can return to work. It seems to me that that is a huge unknown. I know the federal government is grappling with it, and they are at the state level. But for a county of 1.2 million people, um, we are going to have unprecedented expenditures in trying to figure out at what point the county is ready to go back to work and to go back to school. You know, how, do you, how are you trying to devise what kind of resources need to be allocated for that? Well, this is one of the big challenge areas because, frankly, uh, I'm a true believer that if you uh, roll out kind of a return to normalcy too quickly, uh, you really can exacerbate the problem and, and put a lot of people at risk. And so um, it's difficult because we're all losing patience with, you know, staying at home and doing business differently, and we all want to help our community recover. But if we do that prematurely, uh, we can do a lot more damage. And so uh, first, kudos to our health department because they do a lot of contact tracing. They spend a lot of time when there's an outbreak in our senior congregate living facilities where, you know, unfortunately most of our fatalities have occurred with, with plans to try to help the management deal with outbreaks. They're spending a lot of time getting public information out there, but they're as frustrated as all of us are at the lack of support and organization from the federal, really really mostly from the federal level, but to a certain extent from the state level as well. And the lack of testing um, obviously is, is huge among them. Uh, the lack of um, protective gear that, you know, we've all heard about is, is affecting Fairfax County too. You know, we, we procure a lot of products, and normally when we place a large order, and when it comes to protective gear, we partnered with our other regional governments in this area to place big orders so that, you know, we have a better chance of getting them filled. And we put those orders out, and they've been accepted, and then they get canceled uh, because there was a federal purchase or some other purchase that um, was more important than the local government purchase. And so we're already seeing real problems uh, with getting base of basic protective gear. And so our health department answers a lot of questions about this, and it's hard for the residents to understand that when it comes to testing and some of these things that we don't have the materials that, frankly, the federal government should be providing states and local governments across the country. And so we're in the same boat uh, with those shortages, and that's why it makes it so important that we follow the social distancing guidelines and, and protect ourselves and our family because while the county has a lot of resources, at this particular time it suffers from the same problem most jurisdictions are facing, which is a lack of testing materials and a shortage of protective gear to help our first responders and our healthcare workers uh, do the job that they need to do. And so it's maddening uh, for a lot of us to see that level of disorganization um, and it, it really is affecting the county as well. And so that's one of the reasons it's important that our um, congressional delegation hear regularly from our local governments about what's happening on the ground. And, you know, I've challenged them from the beginning with this issue that there aren't enough tests, there aren't enough facilities testing, frankly. Um, those facilities aren't always in the best locations, in my opinion. Um, to reach vulnerable populations, the transparency of the information about where there are hot spots and infections, the demographic data, um, frankly, is, is lacking in a lot of cases, and that's been a large criticism of mine. I will say that uh, hopefully in the next week, uh, our health department will have a new dashboard online that people can look at that has breakdowns in demographics and other things about uh, folks who have been infected without giving out any personal 
uh, information just to be a lot more transparent with the public because when you have a lack of testing materials, you have a lack of protect, you know, protective equipment, um, it's even more important to know where the biggest challenges are and where the most vulnerable populations are. And that's a transparency uh, area that we need to improve upon and will be here uh, very shortly. But it's challenging because you're dealing with different layers of government. You're dealing with protecting the privacy of individuals. You're dealing with private labs and the different ways that they collect information that may be different than the Virginia Department of Health. And so there's a lot of complexities in, involved in this. but. Um, you know, when we're able to signal to the public uh, that it's okay to resume normalcy as we knew it before, it's really anyone's guess as we sit here on this call. And frankly, it won't be a call of the counties. Um, it will be a call of the states. And the last thing I'll mention on this, having talked to the governor about this recently, um, there needs to be, and I think there will be, uh, much more coordination with the district in Maryland. Um, and we can collaborate on our messaging and when we think it's safe to, to resume some level of life as we knew it before and to be on the same page because what we don't want to do is further confuse the public or send mixed messages uh, in our region about what can people do now and how can they do it safely. And so we're working on those plans now. Um, I think it's anyone's guess as to when that rollout will happen. It's more a state decision than it is a county decision. And so we're just making sure when those announcements come that you know we're prepared uh, to help our community through that. I think this would be a good time to mention to folks that they can actually get updates by text. You can text FFX COVID to 888-777. That is coronavirus updates from Fairfax County by text, FFXCOVID to 888-777. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and we are speaking with Chairman Jeff McKay of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. In this unprecedented moment, there are a lot of moving parts to try to keep residents safe, in the county to keep businesses supported in the county. Chairman McKay has spoken at length about his collaborative relationships with uh, other jurisdictions, with the state and federal uh, representatives from our area. You mentioned briefly before about chambers of commerce. What, what do you see as the best way that we can try to support our local business people, some of whom realistically may not recover from this shutdown. There might be businesses that just don't come back. Right, and, and that's a huge concern of mine because, you know, each business obviously uh, has a little bit different way of making it through a pandemic like this. Some lines of business are much more affected than others. Um, and so there's a few things that, you know, we've done. First, obviously there's the federal programs, and, of course, we're hearing that, the SBA loans um, seem to already have dried up, and frankly, um, based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from our congressional delegation, a lot of frustrations that they probably didn't even go to the people who need them the most. And so I think it's critical that there be a second federal stimulus uh, action taken and that it focuses really on the small businesses because you know helping the big guys out right now, um, isn't going to help save those mom-and-pop shops that operate all over Fairfax County and don't have uh, set aside, you know, finances to be able to weather a storm like this. And so they're my main concern. Uh, to that end, the county has put out its own, we approved at our last board meeting, uh, microloan program that provides uh, loans to very small businesses in Fairfax County for immediate needs. And it's meant to catch any businesses that can't qualify for an SBA loan. And there's a number of reasons why a business might not qualify. And so we're hoping to put in place uh, a lifeline for them, a 0% uh, interest loan to them to help get them through this, especially if they can't get federal uh, support through other means. And so we have sent uh, several million dollars uh, to, to put in place a first phase of that. 
Um, but I believe we're going to have to do a lot more than that. And so we've tasked our county staff with coming up with a few other programs, uh, perhaps grant programs, but also uh, programs that are geared towards some of our nonprofits to help them as well. And so we're working on additional resources for those. Um, the federal resources obviously need to be the first opportunity for people uh, just because the volume of, of money involved there is going to be much higher than what uh, the county is going to be able to provide with its you know, heavy reliance on property taxes. You know, we have to be careful about uh, how big of a role we can play, but at the same time, um, any business, as I remind people, any business that doesn't make it through this and doesn't return uh, offers you know, the county a, a lifetime of lost revenue as well. And so we we got to be cognizant of that and do whatever we can uh, to help these businesses stay in business. And so I'd encourage people, the county has on its COVID-19 webpage, has a whole page dedicated uh, specifically to small businesses and resources that the county has out there now, uh, links to federal resources. Uh, depending on how much money we get through the CARES Act, we may apply uh, some of that money to additional uh, grant programs for small businesses to qualify for. And so this is an evolving area, um, but it's one that I know uh, is going to take a great deal of financial commitment from the county uh, for quite a while because obviously every day that goes by uh, where we can't live our lives as we got used to is a day that affects our small business community. And so uh, we're cognizant of that, and we're going to continue to work with the chambers to get that information out. Our Economic Development Authority is working with us to get that information out. Um, and we're going to set up a team uh, of county staff folks to even help those businesses fill out applications and help them understand them. And, and one of the unique things that uh, I think we're going to be able to do is we have a lot of employees right now, like with our SAC program, after school child care program that aren't working and they want to be working and we want to be paying them and, and helping them pay their bills at home too. And so we're looking at moving a lot of those employees into positions of helping people fill out loan applications and doing the training to be able to get them to pivot towards where we really need the workforce now. And so I think we're going to be able to provide both financial assistance but also uh, a lot of logistical assistance, help, and counseling uh, to some of these businesses that need our help. Well, you know, I, I think that's a brilliant idea, and you point out something really important here, and that is reallocating what resources you have and using them in a way that's different or that maybe you haven't thought of before. If ever there was a time for creativity and innovation and to think differently, now would be that time. And, you know, I would love your final thoughts on what people sitting in their homes listening to a radio broadcast can do about thinking about how they can be part of weathering this epic pandemic and also supporting their community, whether that's their neighbors or it's, it's people in their school community, their faith communities. But, you know, how we can think differently about being creative in how we pull together right now. Yeah, well, we have to be, and, and the county is, you know, is doing that, um, reallocating um, people and resources to areas that just a, a month and a half ago we would have never dreamed we would, we would be having to do. And so, you know, we are doing that. I know the business community out there and our nonprofit community um, is making major pivots. I mean, the creativity of some of our businesses and, and being able to continue to stay open and serve the public uh, has been one of the silver linings in, in this whole uh, debacle. And, and frankly, um, seeing that creativity um, is inspiring. And, and more so, seeing how our community has embraced them. Um, you know, I go pick up, carry out, uh, curbside, some of our small restaurants in and around my home as much as I can. And, and I always smile uh, when I see lines of cars doing the same thing in a safe way. And so what our community can do is support our small businesses, uh, recognize they need our help now more than ever, um, really take care of and protect our families and our neighbors. Um, check on the vulnerable people in your neighborhood. 
Um, pick up the phone and call people that you know that you know may be living alone or may not be surrounded by the, the infrastructure, personal infrastructure and families that a lot of us have, and, and check in on them, see, see how they're doing. Um, and remain optimistic. I think the most important thing that uh, all of us can do right now is focus on some of the positives. You know, when this pandemic started, uh, we had one of the strongest economies in, in, in the nation right here in Northern Virginia. We had some of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of assets. And, and I always tell folks, you know, if you were to weather a storm like this, there's probably no better place in the United States of America to do that than in Fairfax County, where we have dedicated people, first responders, counselors, mental health professionals, nonprofits, uh, every day who are out there working to help our community uh, through this. And as a result of that and a well-positioned county government with foresight, with planning, with contingencies, uh, we probably will be one of the first places in the United States to pull away from this in a positive way uh, and pivot towards normal again. And we have the resources and the dedication and the resiliency here that most places in the country would dream of. And so we have to remain positive and focus on those positive assets amongst all the negative news uh, that's out there. And then lastly, um, in, in protecting our community and our neighbors is, you know, follow the CDC guidance. Um, I am, you know, it's difficult because we want to see each other, we want to embrace family, we want to do the things that really make life worth living. Um, and right now, we all have to stop and say if we really care about those people, uh, we really have to adhere to the, the social distancing guidelines. It's the number one way. Uh, we can help our neighbors uh, through this. And so be safe, check in on each other, take care of each other, adhere to CDC guidelines, remain positive, do something that makes you smile. You know, spend time with, with your kids. If, if you're quarantined at home, take up a new hobby. Uh, go for a safe walk in the community. Uh, do something that helps your mind focus on the more positive things and not on the negativity. And, and we as a community will get through this, and there's no doubt in my mind about that. But we really need to rely on each other's strength right now and, and tenacity and positivity to get through this. Those are words of wisdom that really make sense. And I hope that the people listening to this broadcast take them to heart. I appreciate your time, Chairman McKay. I know you've got a lot on your plate, and it's been wonderful to have you spend an hour with us explaining where we are here in Fairfax County. Thank you so much for being on Making Change Radio.